A long time ago, on a comics page far, far away. Greetings and welcome to May the Panel Be With You, the Star Wars comic book podcast brought to you by the Punch-Up Entertainment Network. I am your humble host, Mike Gargoni, and joining me as always, the Jim Starkiller to my FE9Q tractor droid, it's John Campbell. Hello, everybody. Oh, you know, people are just, I love how these are getting more obscure and people are going like, yeah, Jim Starkiller! Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about Jim Starkiller oh. in this issue. <laughs> Boy, I love when Star Wars characters are named things like Jim. <laughs> but it's Jim with two M's, so you know it's spacey. Oh, yeah, spacey then, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, we continue into uncharted territory of Marvel Unleashed, as I like to call it. <laughs> yes, because, of course, we are talking about issue number eight of 1977's Marvel Star Wars comic. Though, this one, we are now into 78, as this was released February 1st, 1978. Yeah, mm. man, we're getting the, the first stories post the movie here and mm -hmm. oh boy i mean george lucas must have been quaking in his boots because roy thomas is giving us star wars stories of an no uh <laughs> he's giving us uh reskinned flash gordon stories based <laughs> on much better uh western films from a decade previous I did, we had asked if george lucas ever saw these and i did see an interview recently with somebody who was one of his assistants at Lucasfilm, and I think it was specifically in publishing, and she talked about everything would come in and he would kind of just give a cursory glance of all the books and comics, but the answer is kind of no. He'd, <laughs> he'd take more interest in when somebody was pitching an idea and he would mm. go, hmm, thing. but the actual thing would be like, yes, mm -hmm, looks fine, you know. Yeah. And, and of course, by the time you get into the 80s, there's so much shit. Oh, there's so much. But here and now, this is, like we said last episode, this is one of the first post-movie new Star Wars story. Yeah. It is this month that we'll see the release of Splinter of the Mind's Eye, the now novel. Indeed. Yeah, which was, of course, as people know, the uh, the meant-to-be, should the movie not do well, here's a cheap sequel we can make on our own. Right. Of course, that didn't Weird. end up happening because Star Wars made more money than anything ever had ever made. Exactly. So they were just like, make it a book. And that yep. book we'll talk about because uh, someday because they did do a comics adaptation of it. And that book is much like it's better than this comic. But similarly, it's weird because it doesn't yeah. have the context of the other movies. Absolutely. And it's also a story that like can't exist in the context of the other movies because right. of what happens in it and what happens in the later films. It, ha it had to be deemed legends, even though for the longest time it was, you know, or at least for a while was considered like the official Star Wars sequel when it came out. Right. Uh, but for now, we have the official Star Wars continuation written, of course, still by Roy Thomas, though that is going to be changing here in a couple of issues. Because yeah. even now we have a co-writing credit for Howard Chaikin, who is also still on pencils. And we have Tom Palmer now on inks and doing colors with John Costanza on letters. So we have a pretty different uh, creative team, all things considered, compared to last time. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm always about to do my Seinfeld podcast. So, Costanza! Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, this cover, man. Oh, I, we're, I, we're I, already getting to the cover. Yeah, we got to, because this cover right? is something else. Because, while Star Wars is kind of based on the Hidden Fortress, what if I took a different Akira Kurosawa plot and put it in Star Wars? So, mm -hmm. here is Seven Samurai, which is... The idea of Seven Samurai in Star Wars or Magnificent Seven in Star Wars, number one, this is not the last time this is done. Oh, God. But not a bad idea and very much takes on the plot of the Roger Corman movie uh, Battle Beyond the Stars is basically Star Wars meets Magnificent Seven. True. Uh, and I, I have a great affinity for that movie, even if it is of lower budget. <laughs> yes, indeed. So one thing I do want to like point out here is we have still that same logo at last beyond the movie, beyond the galaxy, still in the same galaxy. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we yeah. have eight, eight against a world. And by yeah. a world, we mean six guys led by a racist caricature. And yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we and also yeah. have extra in this episode, in this issue, the deadly mission of Luke Skywalker. 
I'll get to it. Not that deadly. Not uh, that deadly. Not that deadly. <laughs> but yeah, here it is, Han Solo and his unstoppable crew of badass mercenaries. One of which I guess is supposed to be Chewbacca behind him, but I boy, does it look like Werewolf by Night. It really <laughs> looks like Werewolf by Night. Uh, and I mean, I love the idea of, I love all the ideas here. I love Han leading a mercenary team and stuff like that, but it's, look at this weird, this hodgepodge group of weirdos. We'll get yeah. to Jackson because we want to talk about Jackson, but we got uh old man in C-3PO's body, basically, based on this. Those are definitely 3PO's legs holding sure a light. Sure they are, yeah. We got a guy in a bucket hat. Uh, we got a, a we have a weird... Namor in a bucket hat back there. We got Namor in a bucket hat. We've got a porcupine wearing Rachel Ghoul's cape. Uh, <laughs> we've we've got a lady all in pink, and then yeah, there's a tank man far in the back there. And they're up against the shadow of a large brooding creature that will not appear in this comic book. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, one. Green furred rabbit man. Dual wielding blaster pistols. We got Jackson, the leps the lepus oh. carnivorous. Jackson, oh, baby! I hope When's we haven't gonna... built this up too much. When is he gonna be in a movie? All I wanna see. Hashtag live action Jackson. Um he has reappeared a couple of times in ancillary fiction, but we haven't really seen and he is ancillary, yeah. yeah. And I, 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 people don't know, of course, I'm being facetious. He belongs in ancillary things. I love that there is a fandom that keeps him alive. I think that's very quaint. However, keep him as far away from mainstream Star Wars. I think he there's a place for him in maybe one of the animated shows. I think that is a place where you could do him well-ish. Carefully, yeah. Carefully. Carefully. He the second he shows up in this thing, he destroys the entire world of Star Wars, basically, in this issue. Let's, I think the porcupine guy does more damage, but we'll get to well, it. Well, this whole team is very weird. Uh what's interesting is when you talk about the inkers, right? Yeah. Or embellishers as they're called at this time. Yeah, let's get know. to this first page and talk about remember how we say the art radically changes <laughs> continually in these books? Well, strap in, because whoa. Well, because it's just interesting because it looks like it's a wholly different artist, but it's still Chaken. It's just they are uh, uh, the the inking is so radically different that it changes the whole of his look. It shows it's this is actually a good lesson in what inking adds to a comic. Mm -hmm. Well, and the colors for that matter, because we have Tom Palmer not only doing the inks but also the coloring. So it almost, like you said, radically changes what the art style even looks like. Comparing well, this to last issue is really stark. I actually think he's a better colorist than we've had before because it's actually more naturalistically colored. Yeah, that's true. I mean, actually, if anything, actually, I think the art is better in this issue because I think his inking is also a little bit more, his shadows and stuff are a little bit more thought out than some of the other stuff we've done. The lighting um, not... is better. I think the, the colors are more natural. They fit a more Star Wars-y tone. But it's still terrible. Uh... <laughs> it's still not great and it still seems to be rushed but we have a han solo here whose hair isn't prince valiant so that's a nice start no, it's even if his face is yeah it's not i mean you talked about seinfeld earlier there's definitely some kramer happening here uh and the boy he's in a situation here because this lizard man or i'm sorry it's a killer croc guest star appearance uh really because i thought he was uh Flyman from the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Baxter Stockman? I thought it was Baxter Stockman, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's got a little bit of that, but he's got, but for some reason he's wearing Conan's boots. Um, well, they were on sale. Yeah. <laughs> also, I like that they both have stripy pants. Him and Han both yeah. got pants from the same place. That's just, you, those are issued to you in space. And <laughs> I'm sorry, is this guy in the middle watching here not just Luke Skywalker in his Tatooine hat? Okay, we're going to get into just how popular the bu bucket hat with goggles is in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah. But I think yeah. if you're living on a desolate world and you're never going to get off, you're just issued one of those hats when you're born. Also, something I don't think I've ever seen in Star Wars, a guy in glasses. A guy just wearing... Really? I, 
Yeah, I don't know. Because we are catching We've, up back there's, with they're Han not Solo. We've seen people with kind of somewhat spectacle sort of things in Star Wars. Mm. That guy's just wearing, like, lens crafter lenses, though. Like, Yeah. I mean, we'll get into these three in a second, because we're coming back in on Aduba 3, where, lest mm-hmm. we forget, Han Solo, in the last issue, was robbed by spy, sp- space pirates, landed here, helped a bug priest bury a cyborg, then bought a whole round of drinks for this bar, was hitting on a blue lady, and then at the very end of the issue, three... Asian dudes who are no longer Asian showed up and oh, said, God. hey, we need your help so long as you're not afraid of dying. Yeah. But also, new trouble. What I love is, and I had to really, when I because I read, we did these two issues together. For those who don't know, we often do two of these at a time. So I was reading both of these, and from reading last issue into this one, I went, wait, this is just a new problem introduced. This is not the cliffhanger. of Because now somebody's grabbing them going, you're hitting on my girl, pal. Right, because at the end of the last issue, we thought, uh oh, these three dudes are going to try to like leverage Han Solo into something deadly and difficult, and he's not going to have a choice. No, now it's just, hey, that blue girl who you were hitting on, who's actually not in this panel at all and is yeah. never seen again. Uh, no, this green guy is angry that you're hitting on her because that's my gal. Now let's if we go to the next page, this bar brawl breaks out between them that has nothing to do with the cliffhanger of last month's issue. Azura is mine, see? And you'd better keep away from her. The blue-skinned girl that you were talking to before, yeah. that's who. Azura? I don't know. I, I never bothered to get her name, pal. <laughs> yeah, good, Han. Good. Uh, why don't you just waddle along before my Wookiee friend Chewbacca takes you apart? Oh, you've also got to love the idea that everywhere Han goes, he's just like, don't mess with me, or my friend will beat you up. <laughs> I actually really like this opening sequence because it is kind of a classic Han Solo thing where he thinks he has the upper hand because of Chewie. And then when he turns around and Chewie's not there, he gets his ass handed to him. That's classic Han Solo. This actually is a halfway decent Han Solo scene of like Han in a bar fight over this kind of does work. I also love him trying to bash this guy in the face with a chair and going, huh, that didn't work. (laughs) <laughs> also, this green guy still calling him a, a star hopper. That's just Roy Thomas really wants that to be a thing. Yeah, George, you gonna use that in the sequel? I, I no. don't think so. Right? Never once. No, no. But then uh, here comes a, 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 a just a brain and a robot body on the next uh, page. Because yeah, we have uh, Han saying Chewie, where in the blazes? Because you know Han Solo always saying where in the blazes. Where in the blazes? I do, I do love once again filtered through. This is this is just Marvel comics writing. Like any character in Marvel at this time would say, where in the blazes are you? I keep waiting for him to say, sweet Christmas. I mean, it does. It all stems from that. Those kind of dialogue sort of things. Spider Man would talk like this. Mm-hmm. It's the old chum. It's the where in the blazes. It's all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but Han yeah, the- gets on the next page. He gets. Well, I should say he gets platted into this table, as it says. Uh, plat. Uh, so we and- talked about this guy with a a brain and a robot body. Mm-hmm. Wasn't the whole last issue about how this whole town is racist against cyborgs? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. And now they're all over the place. Also, I lo- I do like that this brain in a robot body is uh, in a loving relationship with Alf. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, yo, because uh- <laughs> Alf says, oh, "That was my drink. You knocked over, Skyboy." And <laughs> Willie, get over here. Um, and also, if you look real, cl- real quick, folks, there's a Nebula cameo real quick at the bottom of that panel there. Uh, well, yeah, but Nebula, I mean, first off, the character of Nebula wouldn't be invented until when was Secret Wars? Would that have been happening before this or just after? No, it's after. It's like mid 80s. Yeah. So and also the character looked radically different then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's still just like there's a bald headed blue woman in a, a sure. Ball. Look. Uh, but uh, we do get uh, robot body brain face saying, Hey, you trying to get smart with my girlfriend? Uh, talking about Alf here. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> beat him up. <laughs> I just love the idea of the Alf person going, Beat him up for me. <laughs> also, something I hate is this kind of Han line where he goes, Oh, oh. Number one, oh, oh. Weird. Yeah. Uh, it's not, uh, oh, it's uh, oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, oh. Uh, ducking time again is one of those things where I'm like, 
you don't need that because that's one of those things where if this is in mid action, when is he saying this? That's like a classic does... thing that happens in comic books so often is it characters had... having time to say things in the middle of an action scene. It's something. These are all things. You know, I'm learning a lot as I'm also writing a comic as we're recording this. I'm learning a lot from this about things not to do or things to avoid. Because <laughs> that is something I think about. It's like, the amount of time it would take someone to dive across a room. Do they have time to say all this? Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, we I do a rare just, just straight up comic. Bam! On that, I do like, like a good bam. On a, a totally insane uppercut Han is throwing. I mean, it's pretty much a Shriukin. Um, <laughs> it basically is. And then another oop. What I don't like is that we don't see what he's punching. He's literally just punching the side of the panel, and it says bam over there. It's implied that it's the brain-cased robot bodied, but we never no. actually see that creature tumbling backwards. How about this uh, three-eyed lizard guy, though? <laughs> Oh, he's just trying to get out of the way. He's just like, I don't want any part of this. He is a cousin of the Slee Stacks, actually. Uh, oh, 100%, that. yes. Yeah. And then Han is punched across a room. With <laughs> yeah, because the green guy's back, and he's just like, I'm not your pal, Chewy. Solo throws him across yeah. the room with a good thapoom. Thapoom is actually a pretty great uh, comment. And then, I, dude, panel of the issue, man is Han falling into Chewie's arms, right? The, the, the oh, doesn't get... yeah, this next one. I will say, on this next page... Chewie, Chewie looks right? Chewie looks right. Chewie looks right. The shape of his head, everything is pretty dead on. Han looks insane, this expression he's giving. Also, <laughs> uh, shippers, just pull out this panel where he goes, Chewie, I was just thinking about you. Chewie with a classic gronk? Yeah. And then it is on, baby. I actually really like this page because it is very good comedic comic book timing. It's something you would see in a movie. It's kind of storyboarded very well where the big green angry lizard guy is punching on Chewie, talking about how, oh, I'm just going to keep hitting you. You're going down over this. And then hard cut to lizard guy being thrown through a window outside. <laughs> It's pretty good with a shaboom. Yeah. Which did make me think of like a 50s, like shaboom, shaboom. <laughs> and How do he goes. And yeah. who's this guy just watching going, oh? Just another spacer outside who's probably racist against cyborgs. That's all. <laughs> Except for only sometimes because the brain guy, we're cool with him. Oh, well, but, but that's because he's in a loving relationship with Alf, and who are we to say that... I mean, love hey, is love, John. Love is love. If Alf vouches for that cyborg, then he's cool with us. Yeah. Um, okay, this next panel has... I don't know what this is. This looks like off-brand Wookiee, but maybe these are feathers, though? But it's I don't because, yeah, on the net, we're cranking through this issue because, again, the first four pages here were kind of just this action scene in which we have to resolve the cliffhanger that didn't happen last issue. But much like the last issue, it is just like, I'm sorry, where is the thing about the eight against the plant? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, this isn't even resolved. It introduces a new conflict. The cliffhanger of the last issue would jump us into the Magnificent Seven story. Instead, we're just going, uh, well, let's throw in a bar fight here at the start and then get back to the plot. Because mm -hmm. it is basically like that whole fight happens, and then now Han is like, oh, yeah, what did you guys want again? So <laughs> I want to address Han's first little bit of dialogue here after he says, now we got to see what those peasant types just offered us a job. Go, or go see why those peasant types yeah. offered us a job. Han referring yeah. to them as peasants is a thing that keeps happening through this issue. And the captioning even refers to them as peasants as well. Which implies yeah. a sort of feudal system that I don't think exists here. No, and also, if that somebody does buy into that kind of system, it is not Han Solo. Exactly. Like, Han Solo ever calling anyone a peasant. Like Even if planet do. They call themselves farmers and like just calling them farmers or... Oh, they, no, no. They call themselves lowly farmers. <laughs> <laughs> we lowly farmers in the poorer parts of this planet. And then Han goes, that's what I call starting out at the bottom. What? Yeah, Han's a classist hey. jerk in this. Once again, not at all befitting Han's backstory of being a scrappy guy 
who's making his way in the galaxy coming from nothing. Mm-hmm. You would think if there's one character in Star Wars who would be sympathetic to dirt poor people, it would be him. <laughs> you would think, but no. Yeah. He's just like, oh, peasants, gross. Yeah. And the guy's even like, big pardon, sir? He's like, sorry, I guess I'll have to shelf my sense of humor for a while, eh, Chewie? And Chewie's and- just like, I don't know you. <laughs> And Han continues, anyway, what's your problem, little friend? You're referring hey. to this fully grown man who's older than him. <laughs> Gonna tussle his hair in a second. What's up, little bud? Uh, his name is Ramiz? Ramiz? I don't know. Yeah. Now he was selected. Yeah, also, I was selected to come here. Where'd the other two guys go? Don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. They're looking for a champion, a protector, so to speak. So far, I like the sound of it. You do, huh? Yeah, this this is where we start losing the characterization of Han Solo completely. Because him immediately buying in on this Seven Samurai, Magnificent Seven scenario, and for the rest of the issue, really going along with it, for yeah. no other reason than I'm the protagonist of this story. Because Han is a smuggler and a pilot. He's not a guy who's like... I mean, Han is a guy who will shoot somebody, but he's not a guy looking to get his gun off or get in fights. Han's the kind of guy who wants to outsmart the system. Like, an ideal job for Han is, can you get this past an Imperial force? And he'd be like, yeah, I'm sneaky. That's my thing. And he is specifically on this planet to begin with because he just was robbed and needs a few jobs to get back into enough cash to deal with Jabba the Hutt. Hut with he one should, T at right now. He should be going around, does anybody need some cargo run or something like that, you know? Right. Instead, he is about to accept a job to fight a guy that this guy, this farmer, calls the devil. <laughs> Han's like, I've got to meet this devil. I got to tell you, this is going to be a story. Oh, cut to, let's take a look at this devil, man. Yeah, so oh, he, he, the, this oh. farmer, Ramiz, is describing that, like, my village is being assaulted by the devil and his men, and we need some daring champions to help us, Mr. Solo, because we are dealing with the Cloud Riders and their dread leader, Sergey X. Oh, my God. You talk about a Flash Gordon villain. Look at this guy here. It's, he's, a, he's a Flash Gordon villain mixed with Eli Wallach's bad guy from Magnificent Seven, who's like yes. the Mexican Bandito. Mm-hmm. But this base version, but the, the spurs on his boots. John, we asked last issue about what were star spurs, and you're looking at them right now. Oh, I'm looking at them right now. Oh, boy. But then he's got the the Salvador Dali mustache mm-hmm. and, and the Frankenstein stitching on his head. On his head and the black hair. And this guy is, like you said, kind of the Magnificent Seven Mexican bandit stereotype, but yeah. also in a Flash Gordon costume with... Gig- how, does this, how does this shirt work? The shoulders here are so gigantic. The collar is so big. The buttons are all over this front panel with the Starburst no. logo. No way, like, yeah, where does it come down and button? How does it come together? It makes no sense at all. But he is... Yeah, yeah. Uh, or, uh, yeah. Oh, my God. And, and his buddies on their jet bikes or whatever grabbing this woman out of a pool apparently based on her bathing suit so uh, i want i want to read the captioning here as yeah. ramiz says i that is the name of their leader sergex arrogantus the arrogant one he and yeah. his men outlaws who live in the mist shrouded hills outside of our village come forth each year at about this time to exact tribute from us We who have barely enough to feed ourselves. They stampede our banthas, which we raise for food and transportation. If we try to resist, they'll burn our meager crops, which scarcely feed us as well on the best of years. And then they carry away our wives and our daughters merely to amuse themselves, implying a lot of sexual assault. Uh Oh, yeah. Rapists. Oh, yeah. 100%. I mean, I don't. Yeah. But I do want to talk about the guy who is dragging away the woman from the pool party because he is wearing a bandit mask over his eyes tied around the back. But he's also wearing glasses over those, it looks like. (laughs) 
<laughs> so many glasses in this issue. Uh, it, it's like if one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was wearing glasses over his bandana. Also, immediately here, let's get to this. Is, he goes, we have little money. We can offer you food and shelter. Han should just be like, sorry, buddy. That sounds rough, but we're in dire straits and we really need money. At least in At most all, other versions. This, right. <laughs> in most other versions of this sort of story the villagers aren't willing can't really pay them much mm -hmm. but can pay them a little bit so that attracts some of them who are just like okay i'll take a little bit of payment plus my moral outrage will carry me through the rest of what needs to be done here this guy is literally saying we can offer you nothing yeah yep to han solo famous yeah. scoundrel yeah a guy who might be sympathetic to their cause but would go what this should be, he should say no, then, because Han is a character, if he witnessed this, he'd get involved. Yeah, but it 100%. should be, if you don't have money, I can't help you. Then he sees this guy killed by these people, and then he'd get involved. That's <laughs> what a good story would do. Instead, on the next page, Han Solo's like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll, t yeah, we'll take the job, because it's just like, we got to get this plot moving, so... Uh, but I, and then, and then Han even goes, I want to recruit, recruit a few more people, you know, for whatever payment there is to split even more. Uh, so I have less like, well, let's see, zero divided by zero equals zero. I can't figure out why anybody else would sign up for this then, but here's a line of people. Knock, knock. So Hello. we, oh, God. I, 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 I want to I want to stop on this first panel here though when Han agrees to take this job because he says yeah that would be a real loss for the galaxy all right as though he's like implying oh such a shame that you p humble dirt farmers are getting robbed and uh stolen away and but anyway I'll uh risk my life to save you people yeah it's such a weird turn here not only is it inconsistent with the Han we know it's inconsistent from panel to panel and then he goes on to say, but I want to recruit a few more of these down on their luck spacers before we leave for your village. Spread the word, huh? And of course the farmer going, yes, Master Solo. Immediately, Master Solo too. Yikes. Yeah. That's just, that's just how much this guy has done his luck. He's just like, yes, anyone is my master because I'm so lowly. Uh, and then, yeah, it's an audition. Let's go to the auditions for uh, for mercenaries. Okay, so the next few pages are just a series of auditions for mercenaries to join his team. My question to you is, why is Han Solo shirtless through all of this? <laughs> that really threw me. And also, so, so jacked. Oh, like, I mean, yeah. Harrison this is the part in the movie <laughs> where... <laughs> yeah, Lee Harrison Ford always fit but he never looked like this uh, no 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 no. but it gets uh, butts and seats john oh yeah <laughs> these pages uh, are for the ladies because we also have a shirtless porcupine man here who is wearing rachel ghoul's cape <laughs> he's wearing rachel ghoul's cape and he's got a like a cat face he's got a cat he's a face weird... but he's spiny all over he looked way more like a porcupine on the cover here yeah he looks like a weird muskrat yeah, and I just love the way he comes to you. Uh, I, I was reading him last night and like, my name is Hedgy, and I never use a gun. It's Hedgy There's the Hedgehog. I'm just getting that now. God damn it. Yeah. There's something about the way his head is down that I felt he should have. Well, hi there. Uh, yeah, and it's like, sorry, pal. Oh, I also love, we're not looking for someone who specializes in thumb wrestling. He does Ooh, got a, a he's thumb got wrestling. Rest, uh, reference in a Star Wars book. He, he does have a wrestling look about him, though, with the cape and the, the tights and the boots. Oh my god, it is Hedgy and he is coming in with his porcupine spikes! Never in my life have I seen such a thing! Yeah. <laughs> he he reminds me of a character you might see in Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. 100%, and that is exactly the face I'm thinking of. It is the design that the characters in that have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he goes, but check this out. Zick, zick, zick. Because, yeah, on the next page, we see that he can shoot his spines out of his body, and that's why he doesn't need a gun. And Han is going, wow. Anyway, you're hired. Open mouth, insert boot, says Han Solo. Uh, that sounds like him. 
He says, I didn't know there were any of you spiners left in the galaxy. Spiners apparently being just like a species yeah. that Han would know. Also, I like the guy goes, so I'm glad to hear, but my sources were a bit vague as to what I'm being hired for. And Han just goes, yeah, I'll tell you later. <laughs> and the guy's like, cool. <laughs> so here's like, all of this is really building towards like Han knows something that nobody else does. Cause like, why would he take the job? Why is he being so coy with everyone about what they're doing? And I've read ahead. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be you, prepared you to be disappointed like, for the answers oh, to these questions. Of course. <laughs> This podcast might as well be called Prepare to be Disappointed. Uh, <laughs> uh, this pose on the third panel in the middle there on Han, so weird. And yeah. him being shirtless makes it even weirder. He's shirtless through all of this. It's so bizarre. Why is he shirtless well, the whole time? He's very happy to be shirtless when this sexy lady walks in. and she We know she's a sexy lady because Chewie's going, Haruk! Haruk indeed, Chewie. Uh, okay. And this person apparently knows Han because she comes in with a hello solo. It's been a long Our old time. Our buddy Amaza, den mother of the black hole gang. Which, sure, I'll take a, a, a strange, sexy gangster lady with like a kind of a 50s fur yeah. coif around her shoulders and a bikini. Yeah. Yeah, the des well, the design is uh is leaving. We're leaving Flash Gordon, entering like Frazetta territory now. Oh We're yeah, hundred percent. Like, look a little bit, but yeah, the weird pom poms on the shoulders. She's uh, got so she's got stockings up to like near the top of like mid thigh. Then she's yeah. wearing a bikini, so like a red around the waist with a couple of holstered guns at her waist. Uh, yeah. And like a, a red uh, bra with those big pink pom poms around her back and her shoulders. And then she has these big gold chains around her neck and through her ears and a bright red rose in her stark white hair. This is a striking figure that, yeah, reminds me of like a Frazetta drawing or something out of Tank Girl. Yeah, it's it's a little over designed for my taste. It's a bit much. Well, uh, especially once we look, see in the next panel that she's got cat eyes. Yeah! <laughs> then it's just like, oh, wait, 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 wait. We forgot to make her alien. Uh, cat eyes. Yeah. Uh, and apparently um, she knows Solo from way back, and he thought she was dead, and she thought he was yeah. dead, and now they're going to work together because they're old friends, and you just know she's going to betray him at some point because she is, like, drawn to, well, I'm only drawn badly kind of a look. Yeah. Say this, sailor. Mm -hmm. Like, she's got may west kind of vibe to her yeah and then oh god this just this embarrassment of a character in my opinion this weird old jedi so this is don, don juan quixote obi-wan quixote that is unacceptable to call him don juan quixote yeah so it's oh, clearly I know with this yeah, he's not it, a Jedi, obviously no of course not because it's a don quixote riff right no what is that in there i didn't <laughs> so subtle so subtle i know but don Juan quixote he's drawn with like the 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 pointy gray beard and the mustache and the balding pate of like any drawing you've ever seen of don quixote and yeah he might as well have a donkey with him um yeah and, yeah. yeah, this is a guy who's proclaiming to be a Jedi Knight, even though Han saying, like, didn't Darth Vader kill all those guys? Well, I like first the Jedi have been outlawed since the rise of the Empire. And then it's like, uh, and then I like, uh, yeah, I know he's crazy, Chewie. <laughs> Doesn't even realize Darth Vader destroyed the Jedi years ago. But he won't get in the way too much. So, yeah, let's bring this psycho with a lightsaber onto our team. Also, yes, he does, in fact, have a lightsaber with a yellow <laughs> blade. Yeah, and on Han's like, hey, buddy, careful with that lightsaber there. Can't you see I'm shirtless? He's still <laughs> shirtless. <laughs> also, something wrong with his arms in that last panel. They're a little too long. Oh, I mean, there's a lot wrong with that last panel in terms of anatomy, but that's yeah. not necessarily, that's par for the course on this book, quite frankly. Yeah. And then I like, there's, there's, there's turmoil in the line, people are arguing about people's place in line for these interviews for mercenaries. And yes, folks, it's Jackson time. Why are they arguing? 
Because, okay, this is the green guy from the beginning of the book, right? Who got his ass yeah. handed to him by Chewie. Yeah. And we'll find out later his name is Wardo, which I find very funny. But because yeah. <laughs> he's big, green, and warty, get it? That's why his name's Wardo. Roy Thomas is doing no work on these names. None at all. <laughs> and they're arguing about placement line, this Wardo guy in Jackson. Why? No, I don't why? know. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, hey, it's my turn, buddy. Hey, no cut. Jackson is basically saying no cuts. But why? That I still, uh, my Jackson, Jackson's got to have like a Looney Tunes voice, right? So oh, like, he sounds that- like Bugs Bunny. Now move it, Pops. We yeah. ain't got all night out here in the lobby, you know. Excuse me, oh, Junior. Least way I'm next so we can finally get the show on the road before it's sun up. Yeah. And then, yeah, uh, the, the Jackson gets backhanded by this guy. Wardo, yeah, was- please, John, yeah. use his name. Yeah. Yeah, Wardo. Uh, but I really got to insist you haul your wart covered caucus back to the end of the line. Blitz, so, off, Rodin. Yeah. If you haven't seen him already, please go look up. Just type yeah, in Star Wars if Jackson if you're just listening yeah. to this. That's two X's, by the way. Two X's in the middle of his name J A X X O N. So yeah. Jackson is a giant, tall, green rabbit man. He has mm-hmm. big rabbity feet, but two arms, two legs, and he has a head that is just a green bunny head. With big yep. teeth coming out the front, and he looks like a Looney Tune. He does, and can we turn the page? Because talk about a Looney Tune, when this big foot of his sends Wardo ka-chopping out of the frame. Yeah, tumbling down the stairs. And yeah. so, yeah. Jackson is an invention of this comic, and he will be yep. in this comic for a long time to come. So strap in. A lot of these characters we're meeting now, Don Quixote and uh, some of these other ones, they'll come and go. But Jackson's yeah. here to stay. And Jackson totally feels Marvel of this era with your Rocket Raccoons and your Howard the Ducks, right? Yep, 100%. That is very much... This is... Any other time that they get the Star Wars license, they wouldn't create this guy. But in 1977, 78, that is a perfect time for them. To, for them. Even the way, this made me very much think of Rocket Raccoon, the way he's like, I'm more what you're calling a basic lepus carnivorous, a meat-eating, rocket-riding rabbit to you, Junior. Mm-hmm. Number yeah, one, that's... the idea that he would identify himself as a rabbit is weird. In Star Wars? John, in the next line, he's going to say the word space carrot. Just move on. (laughs) Just, it's bad, okay? Uh... (laughs) I don't know. There is, Jackson is so, such an inexplicable addition to this comic that continues for way longer than it ever should. And it's just one of those things where it's like, he is the Roger Rabbit of the Star Wars universe in that... Seeing him standing next to uh, Bob Hoskins is something you just have to accept if you're going to enjoy the story. Well, the difference is I do enjoy Who Framed Roger Rabbit very much, and I don't enjoy this that much. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but a, yeah, a still I, shirtless Han Solo says, "Well, you beat up Wardo, so you're in for the job, Jackson." Yeah. Uh, so, and, uh, well, and immediately he's like, call me Jax for short, which I ain't. Thanks, Looney Tune. By the way, if anyone at Disney is listening, I am available to do the voice of this character in one of your animated projects. Mm-hmm. I'd love to play that on. Um, but, uh, so anyway, uh, let's, let's meet our last two people here. Jim Starkiller. <sighs> and... So- half tank half robot friend yes so at the bottom of this page we meet jim as han turns to this kid and says what's a youngster like you doing in this line uh boy boy this last panel with shirtless han putting his arm out like to this kid yeah yikes yeah 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 there's some there's some power dynamics here that need to be addressed 
There's also some physics problems with these with these tank treads going up these stairs. Also, in the last couple of pages, we've seen these two at the back of the line. The tank guy yeah. was already at the top of the stairs. I he know. was standing behind Jackson on the last page. And it makes no sense the way he's just basically floating above these steps here. Well, he's unless thinking. he's slowly rolling backwards down the stairs and can't stop himself. Oh, no, but here he is at the top there. But, yeah, this guy is basically a freckled, skinnier Luke Skywalker. And he's got the same bucket hat with uh, goggles on the top that we've seen uh, Raisin had earlier in this issue and Luke had at the beginning of the... <laughs> At the, at the beginning of this adaptation. Just like the Luke of the comics, he's a little punk. Yeah, he says, he sure is. My handle's Jim, but I call myself the Star Killer Kid. Oh, I hope you die, Jim. You oh, should I hope die. Jim dies. So, by, we, by we need story standards in a Western, this character should die. Yeah, 100%. Uh, or in a better Western, Han Solo would sacrifice himself so he could live. But that's not going to happen because Han Solo can't die. Uh, no. We and need to talk about did, the name I don't know any- Starkiller, though. Starkiller. Yeah. So, obviously, that's a reference to Lucas's original notes or draft of maybe, Star Wars. Ma- maybe not obviously. I don't know who's listening to this, but like Starkiller is a name that was used pretty regularly through the earlier drafts of the original Star Wars. The, well, originally it was uh, uh, the Star Wars, the adventures of Anakin Starkiller, right? Wasn't that when Correct. it first started? Yep. Uh, based on the, the, I love the, when he, the audacity of Lucas to turn in a thing called like the Star Wars, the adventures of Anakin Starkiller from the journey of the wills was like the title page. Journal of the wills. Yes. Journal of the wills. Yeah. Uh, the journal of the wills. And it's just like, it, just to slap that on a studio's desk and not have them be like, fuck is this man what kind of gleep glop nonsense is this yeah so this is a reference to that and it would be later used a lot in different star wars things people always want to try to find a way to bring in star killer because it's kind of a like wink wink sort of star warsy thing and it mm-hmm. is a cool name star killer i mean eventually uh, we'd get it in the sequels right with star killer base Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, also used more successfully, I would argue, in the Force Unleashed games as the code oh, name for Vader's secret agreed. apprentice. Agreed. Much better used. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a thing. So I, I was surprised to see it this early, though, already. Uh, but I just love the... this. So this is basically C-3PO with tank treads, right? He's a tractor robot who is called yeah. FE9Q, or FE for short. Yeah. I just love him going, shut up, Effie. Well, because Effie is calling Jim out as being like, and this idiot calls himself Starkiller. Yeah. <laughs> These two, where was their buddy comedy spinoff? <sighs> so, <laughs> Starkiller and Effie meet Frankenstein. Uh, here's my biggest issue with Effie. is not yeah. that he is C-3PO on tank treads. It's the fact that his head comes up to everyone else's waist. That's what I find the most upsetting. Yeah, that is weird. Like, uh-huh. the tank treads are barely higher than someone's calf, and so his torso comes up to about hip height, and so he is staring at everyone's crotch in Who every panel he's in. Isn't there an X-Men character that's like this, too? There's a guy who's, like, half a tank. Uh... Oh, he's one of the... um. The Reavers, the cyborg guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to have an action figure of him. He's not a great character, but he was a cool action figure. Is his name just Tread? I don't no, remember. No, it's silly. It's I. It's something. I got to look this up now. We can keep talking, but uh, mm-hmm. typing an X Men tank guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, here he is. Uh, his name is Bonebreaker. Ah, uh, Bonebreaker. Of course, of course, yeah. of course. Yeah, and he's got, oh my god, what a 90s design. That's right, he has a mohawk, too. Yeah. He's got but a but mohawk, no, it, his lower half is tank treads. At least he is uh, maybe shorter than everybody else on the Reavers, but he's his head is at least at everyone's shoulder height. He's not yeah. at waist height for everyone else. Yeah, yeah. It is almost like they're just ignoring him, because he's like, excuse me, down here, <laughs> hello, mm-hmm. is anyone hearing this? Well, there's also the very strange droid politics we get in any Star Wars story. Yeah, 
And so, uh, oh God, though, when Han is going, you remind me of another cocky kid I used to know. Dot, dot, dot. Name of Luke Skywalker. <laughs> like, not enough to just... And then also, hmm, I'm remembering Luke Skywalker. And oh boy, is this some lazy writing when he goes, I wonder what he's up to right now. Can we talk about the Luke that is drawn above Han's shirtless head as he is reminiscing about Luke Skywalker? It's how Han Solo sees Luke Skywalker in his head. It's hey! Smiling cherubic innocence. <laughs> yep, that's how I see him. And Han kind of has... This Han uh, is very detailed, but he's a real male model looking Han. He doesn't have the sort of ruggedness of Harrison Ford in this drawing of him either he's a real like smoothed out mm. i will say the han face in this particular issue has been far more consistent than we've seen in previous issues you wonder if some of the i do think this inker is much better and colorist yeah. i do wonder if that's contributing because it's still shake and drawing but i just wonder if he if his inking is a little bit more polished and making some of this because i do think across the board the art is better in this yeah, I think uh, it definitely helps. And keeping yeah. consistent levels of detail on a character's face is huge to making them rec recognizable, it turns out. <laughs> Meanwhile, let's go back to Yavin 4 uh, and a whole bunch... Uh, Roy Thomas loves to describe Yavin 4. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. And loves Fourth. to tell you about, once again, previously on Star Wars, since the destruction of the Death Star... The rebels on that verdant world have been in constant vigil. Though only a few telltale recon towers jutting up through the thick jungle would give them away while beneath the surface on Yavin 4. We have uh, Luke and, and Leia talking about Luke's daring new mission. And this guy who gets the most detail all the way to the right is a total Flash Gordon character. What is this uniform, insignia? None of this is anything we know from the Rebels. Well, that's because he is a member of Star Force, John, an elite member of the Kree Empire. <laughs> he does! He looks like that! I can't... How'd that guy sneak in here? <laughs> He's a character from at... Nova. Yeah, he does look like he works for the Nova Corps. Uh, <laughs> and once again, there's an idling, floating space taxi over there. We love yeah, those space. Tacky. Gotta love that space tacky that is driven by a very tiny person because the force perspective here makes it look very small. It does. Uh, I will say, turn to the next page and uh, the Princess Leia design in this, I have some serious problems with. Yeah, she's back to I just got rescued off the Death Star look, which she abandoned yeah. real quick after they got yeah. back to Yavin. Yeah. Uh, also, I Luke's back to his Tatooine duds, totally ditching the yellow jacket. <laughs> I mean, that is one of the things I like in the Jason Aaron run of Star Wars that, like, well, immediately after that, that was, like, his look for a while. Which was uh, awesome. It was, because I always thought that jacket was underused. I love that jacket. Mm. Uh, and also, we've got him going back to, I'm no hero, princess. Oh, I'm just whiny. Luke. Shut up, Luke Skywalker. God. Luke, you just blew up the Death Star. Get out yeah. of your own ass for a second. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's just like, well, I don't know, man, if I'm any kind of... And so the big plot here is they've got to find a new hiding spot for the Rebels. Because once Darth... I love the idea of how long is Darth Vader just spinning out in space somewhere? And they go, well, once somebody picks him up, he's going to tell everybody where we are. Which is true. Yeah. Also, and did you talk about Darth Vader being the only survivor of the Death Star? None of those other TIE Fighter pilots made it. I mean, there's a whole thing, and, and actually this comes up in Jason Aaron's run as well, that, like, some people did evacuate just before the thing exploded, including some of those admirals. We'll see <laughs> Modi show back up in the comics in the they're, Marvel they're, era. They are evacuated in the Death Star. Tarkin refuses to evacuate. So that implies other people did get it. It is sort of a thing where I'm just going, well, they, not everybody died, surely. But the vast of, majority... The vast majority did. I do think it would make sense that it would be like top brass would have gotten away. And like yeah. I said, some guys were out in TIE fight. Now, they were probably pretty close to the thing, but you're telling me nobody was flying at Yavin or something? I don't know. Anyway. That's anyway. a logistics thing that is hardly ever addressed because... It just, they just hear they're like the lone survivor of that. But this is such a quick check-in with Luke that that does nothing for this story. No, it just sets up that Luke is off, going to do his own thing. My question here is, is this ship that he's flying away, is that supposed to be the Tantive Four? I believe is that, it is. Is that it supposed looks, to be the Blockade it, Runner? Because it seems way smaller than it should be. If you look at the last page and like it being parked there. 
it's got the hammer head it's got the engines on the back of it it's absolutely looking like the blockade runner yeah but and it's just him on that entire big ship well that seems weird because we would know luke would travel around in his x-wing so that's weird to me that he's also and that then ship can be crewed by like 50 guys that we saw at the beginning of the first star wars movie yeah, it's weird. It's a, it's kind of a waste of the ship to send it off with Luke. Uh, it's just Luke and the droids, though, I guess. So he's he's running around, and oh my god, the internal monologue. It's all just, oh boy, I was just a farm boy on Tatooine, and now look at where I am. Oh, this is so wild. Oh, Ben Kenobi, he's... Uh, bah, bah, bah. Oh my god, go to the next page, and this is my favorite exchange. I was just thinking about Ben, and three people going, Ben? Oh, you mean Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> and Luke being like, well, he may have been Obi-Wan to the rest of the galaxy, 3PO, but to me, he was Ben, the greatest man I ever knew for three days. This man I ever knew is also a line I love. Now, I say this as... My second favorite character in all of Star Wars is Obi-Wan Kenobi. So I he is one of the greatest people in the world. But yeah, Luke didn't really know him for I mean, he's pretty awesome, but like oh, Uncle the, Who? The greatest <laughs> man I ever He's literally looking at the hand on the head and the panel going, Yeah. Oh, that Ben Kenobi. Oh, he impressed me so. He sacrificed himself so we could escape from the Death Star. Remember? Let's, and I'll let's, never rest till I've come face to face with Darth Vader and made him pay for Ben's death, baby. Oh, I'm going to cut his head off. <laughs> Funny, though, Luke goes on now that we're uh, doing a dictation from a novel. Roy Thomas is so happy to be back writing prose now, you know. <laughs> Lord, Lord Vader, Vader. would kill me if Han Solo hadn't come to the rescue. Good old Han. I guess he's living it up back at Mos Eisley at this very minute with all the treasure the rebels gave him. Though he's really not as mercenary as he lets on, you know. Yeah, I wonder what he's up to right now. As the comic book Come attempts on. to crosscut. <laughs> Come on. This is horrible. This is object. Roy Tom, we've talked about this. Roy Thomas has written a lot. Of I love like Roy Thomas's Conan stories, but we also talk about this kind of stuff works better in Conan because it's so grand and mythic, and mm. also he's such a stoic character that you kind of do have to go and yay, Conan wandered the deserts looking right. for the winner. You know, you sort of have to. But it's just this stuff is so bad, and I really do think, and I don't, I've never heard him talk about this. I really do think he may have liked Star Wars, but this was a gig, and he's like, I don't think this was his top priority by any stretch of the imagination. I've talked and about it before. Yeah, we Archie Goodwin has been credited as the like supporting editor on this for a while, yeah. and it's become becoming increasingly clear as these issues go on that like, yeah, Roy Thomas isn't putting in his best work. Yeah. And there's some people behind the scenes that are hoping to take control of this thing. And his name is Archie Goodwin. Archie Goodwin loves Star Wars, man. He can't wait. And we'll get uh, to him on issue 11 because yeah, my, for now we cut back to shirtless Han Solo interviewing this, a child. This made me laugh. Like his, he looked up to the side and goes, I wonder where Luke is. And then we come back. Like he's been staring off in the distance for a while. And this guy goes, well, Solo, you going to take me? Huh? Uh, oh, right. Uh, sorry. I was just wondering what Luke Skywalker was up to. Uh, <laughs> Shirtlessly yeah. in this hallway. Sorry, kid. I guess my wa my mind just wandered off there for a second. All right. You can come. I'll show you how to use that blaster later. Han is going to get this kid killed. <laughs> he has to, right? Uh, and then, oh my god, uh, my new favorite thing about Effie, he's going back down the steps with his treads. His headlights! And also, that that stairway is so dark, apparently. He's yeah. like, Hold on, let me turn on my headlights. Well, that's because Han's bare chest is being used as a bounce filter up at the top of the stairs. So that's where all the light is going. Well, I mean, talk about that. He's got that real barrel chest here. Look at it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I keep yeah. harping on it. It's just so bizarre to me that he has these series of interviews all while not wearing a shirt. Oh, didn't see you there. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He should have the, the the barbell in his hand, like oh, yeah. like he's it's, he's pulling a Ron Burgundy, hundred uh, percent. Except yeah. his like smooth waxed chest, completely clean of hair. The uh, trap 
trapezoid connects to the upper dorsimus. It's boring. <laughs> it's my life. Uh, it's the best. And Han going like, yeah, I know our crew sucks, Chewie. But what are you going to do? We literally have no money to offer anyone. <laughs> Which, if he said out loud, would make everyone in this crew go, wait, you're not paying us? Mm -hmm. Except for maybe Don Quixote here. Here they are assembled for the next day. <laughs> oh, boy. And they, I mean, when you see them lined up, you're like, oh, boy, this is a loser of a crew solo. Uh, mm -hmm. Haru. And I think that's what Chewie's saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He, Haru. I see him, Chewie. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> because here come the Sky Speeders. Yeah. I mean... It they're, they're, I will say the comic is, these aren't the designs of them, of course, but they're, they're getting to, uh, uh speeder bikes before, uh, Jedi does. Yeah. And we'll see something actually very similar to this in the solo movie, quite frankly, with Emphis Nest yeah. and her Raiders in yeah. that film. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the aforementioned punk kids in Boba Fett have bikes that are more like these in design. Yeah. Those are pretty lame like Vespas though compared to these rocket powered yeah. crotch rockets we've got here. Yeah. As so yeah, anyway, it, it is the Cloud yeah. Riders led of course by Serge X. Serge X. Uh and Han's like, "All right everybody, be cool. Let's not start shooting everybody." <laughs> and look who's joined Serge X's Cloud Riders. Why if it isn't oh. our old friend Wardo. <laughs> no way, man. That guy is crooked. <laughs> Uh, well, Mr. Solo, may I assume we meet under a flag of truce? I'm fresh out of bandanas, but you're on, Sir JX. You are <laughs> Sir JX Arrogantus, aren't you? Once again, the constant reminder, you're that one, the bad guy in this issue, huh? The main <laughs> villain we're supposed to be? An unfortunate title for one of such delicate sensibilities as I... Oh, uh, this would be, the, this would be uh, well, he's already in there. I was going to say the Benicio del Toro part, but it's actually maybe more a Javier Bardem character. This is absolutely uh, a Javier Bardem character. I'm, by the way, I need Javier Bardem as this character in live action. Just him as like space scoundrel would rule. Uh, With an enormous handlebar mustache. Yes. Oh, you have to, he has to look exactly like this. And I want the <laughs> stitch scars and stuff like that. Uh, and so, yeah, they're, they're in a little tete -a tete here, a sand rat like you. I, I don't love that. Uh, yeah, this is again, yeah. more of solo being a little high and mighty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cause it is just sort of like, yeah, Han, Han knows he's a criminal dirt bag. He kind of owns that. Yeah. Uh, uh, if anything, we, I mean, I think the thing about Han is he's not that, but he calls himself that to sort of protect himself, you know? He calls yeah. himself that to survive, and that's the whole point of Solo, right? Is there's only yes. a few people out there who know that he's a good guy at heart. Yeah, exactly. So go to the next... There's just way too much, and yep, on the next page, who's the first idiot pulling a piece? <laughs> yeah. It's Jim Starkiller. I do love that <laughs> Amaza, which is such a terrible name for this character. Horrible. Uh, Horrible. <laughs> is going to immediately just clock him on the back of the head and say like, don't start a firefight kid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you've had your say friend. Now, why don't you and your cloud riders go home and play, but I'd steer clear of that peasant village. You know, those peasants, you know, those were... dirt farmers, those lowly muck tillers, those peasants, those beneath us, those who would call me Han Solo master. <laughs> but you are not me star pilot. And if you persist, you will soon be nothing. Just one more lifeless corpse twisting in the desert wind. As I've been doing that voice uh, of this era, Ricardo Montalban. Mm, right. Fine but, Corinthian leather. Yes, right. If, <laughs> imagine him with that mustache, giving some of the, the same energy he brings to Khan as this guy. Mm -hmm. Soon be nothing, just one more lifeless corpse twisting in the desert. Like, it's just, it's so much... And then, and then uh, Han's like, eh, shit. <laughs> We've maybe bitten off more than we can chew this time, old buddy. I don't know. But let's get moving, <laughs> Starhoppers. It's a thing, right? Starhoppers, that's a thing. 
It's the I, I go back. It's like the Mean Girls line. Stop trying to make Star House Hoppers happen, Roy Thomas. It's not going to. We've got some banther riding to do. And next issue, showdown on a barren world. So, John. If yeah. you were leading a team of misfit mercenaries against yeah. a pirate crew to safeguard yeah. a village for little to no pay, and in your yeah. first meeting with the villain, one of your crew draws a gun with the intent of starting a firefight before yeah. action has even progressed, would you choose yeah. to bring that idiot along oh, no. with you? Oh no, he's staying home. Uh, <laughs> he and he and his tank robot friend can stay here. If the if the city you are currently leaving is literally fifteen feet behind you, and you have the option to say no, you don't get to come anymore, you'd take yeah. that option, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. This guy is going to get everyone killed. So it's strange, wouldn't you say, that Han Solo chooses instead to press onward Good <laughs> with Lord. this massive liability in tow. This Han Solo is not heroic, not cool, not competent at all, man. This guy is going to end up being a general in the Rebel Army? Well, of I course. Don't think so. He'll lead the final assault on Endor, John. Yeah, he, he will be one of the great heroes of the Rebellion that will ultimately bring down the Empire. Yeah, I totally see that from this issue. Uh, <laughs> you know what this issue tells me? This issue tells me that this is going to be the father of Kylo Ren, the guy who's going to fuck the uh, entire Republic over in a few decades. Actually, yeah, that 100%. <laughs> this guy ends up raising a total monster of a kid. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, terrible. Yeah. So that is issue number eight of Star Wars. Uh, we are into the vast unknowns now of Marvel's own uh, Star Wars comics. And as you can probably beyond tell by this point, it's a rough ride. We're beyond the movie and beyond the galaxy, Gurgoni. You already have a podcast, John, where you yeah. and our friend Michael Lisman talk about crappy action movies from across yeah. the decades. We sure we, do. We seem to now have a second podcast on the network talking about, uh, let's call it B-tier media. It just happens yeah. to be a little bit more focused. Yeah, yeah. It does have, there's some of the same kind of energy here for sure. So we are going to continue to press on through the Marvel era of Star Wars comics, but rest assured we have plans to maybe sprinkle in some other stuff here and there because while we do love the anachronism of this type of stuff, it can be a little uh, oppressive on your humble hosts here no. and there. So enjoying some changes here and there of uh, Star Wars stuff from across the decades because Boy, is there so much Star Wars comics um, yeah. that taking it in chronological order, it would be years before we ever got out of even the Marvel Star Wars comics and into the more, yeah. I think, more interesting Dark Horse stuff. There's like a hundred and some odd issues of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's a lot. So, uh, And we haven't even gotten through ten yet, so... <laughs> But yeah, uh, of course, thank you so much for listening. As always, you can help support us by uh, hitting subscribe or commenting or what have you. Uh, toggle all the dongles here on YouTube. Hit that notification button. Smash that subscribe button um, because mm -hmm. here on YouTube and if you're listening to this, you can find all of the podcasts from the Punch-Up Entertainment Network here on our YouTube page or across wherever you might get podcasts. Leaving a review on any of those platforms is always helpful. And, of course, the best way to support the show and to get cool exclusive bonus content is to go to our Podbean patron page, which is patron.podbean.com slash punchup. And there you can find all sorts of bonus material from this show, from material components, from Panel Up, from Campbell and Jones Meet the Monsters. All of the podcasts and shows we do here have some form of bonus content over there on the Podbean patron page. Indeed. But I think that wraps it up this week, Gurgoni. Yes, indeed. And of course, I have been your humble host, Mike Gergoni. Uh, and I'm John Campbell. And as always, may the panel be with you. Uh -huh.